And it's my privilege and pleasure now to introduce uh, the incoming president of the, Austra of the International <laughs> Literacy Association, Professor Diane Barone. Diane is also a foundation professor of literacy at the University of Nevada, Reno. She's currently editor of The Reading Teacher and has served on the International Literacy Association Board of Directors, won the John Manning Award for Service to Public Schools in 2010, and served as editor of Reading Research Quarterly. Diane teaches courses in literacy and qualitative research methods, and her research has always focused on young children's literacy development and instruction in high poverty schools. She's had articles published in journals such as the Reading Research Quarterly, Journal of Literacy Research, Elementary School Journal, The Reading Teacher, Gifted Childhood Quarterly and Research in the Teaching of English. Some of her recent co-authored books including Reading First in the Classroom, Literacy and Young Children, Research-Based Practices and Teaching Early Literacy, Development, Assessment and Instruction. Diane has served as the editor of Reading Research Quarterly and has just completed terms as a board member of the International Literacy Association and the Nat National Reading Conference. And I think your presidency is about two weeks away. Could you join in welcoming me, welcoming with me, <laughs> Professor Diane Barone to the stage. Okay, so it's after lunch and we're gonna have some fun. So I want you to know that as I go through, um, the presentation that um, I prepared for you today, um, I'm going to expect you to participate. So it's just a heads up, because otherwise I know you might go to sleep because you just had a great lunch, right? So, so just know that. Okay, I've got all the fancy technology, so we'll, hopefully I won't break it. Um, so we're going to look at the visual within picture books. Um, you come from a strong tradition of looking at the visual United States obviously has followed that. Um, and we're going to explore looking at the picture book first just for images. I'm not gonna focus on text at all. Not that I don't know that it's there, but we're not gonna focus on it. We're gonna try to get meaning looking at um, the illustrations. And I'm gonna be borrowing, there were so many connections uh, between yesterday and today within presentations, so you'll hear some of that repeated from me. So we're going to, um, since picture books are both, right, text and image, but this time, most of us as teachers particularly always give preference to the text, but we're not going to do that. We're gonna give preference to the illustration. Um, and because they carry meaning that may or may not relate to text. When I work with my undergraduate students and with teachers um, who are practicing in school districts that I work with, the assumption always is, at first, that the text and the image will connect, and we all know that that's not necessarily true. Um, and then it's it, that visual, and we're not gonna do like a picture walk, I'm, so I'm not focusing on trying to get to the text at all, but just focusing on the, the image. Um, so picture books are different in, in, from going to an art gallery, because in an art gallery you would look at the, the painting or the photograph or whatever, and it's, it's a, a one-time thing, right? You can keep looking at it and interpreting it, but that's it. A picture book is different because the illustrator has generally 32 pages, right, to continuously build um, meaning through the, the image. Um, in the US, especially, teachers give absolute priority to the text. And in many cases, when I've seen them read books, picture books to children, the kids aren't even seeing the images um, because the, uh, the focus is on the story and what does the story mean. That's not necessarily wrong, and I don't want to imply that, but a picture book is both, right? So we want to honor both. Um, and then Crass, my hero, right, um, talks about the notion of image and how we come to image. It's not a sequence in the way that we interpret it. It's just there, and it's emotional. This is something I'm trying to play with right now, particularly as I'm seeing young children, because my work is with really young children for the most part, come to learn how to read and write. So we had pictographs, right, with cave drawings historically, and then we went through this whole big deal with alphabet and letters 
um, and privileging text. But now when I'm looking at what everybody is doing, they're using emo emojis, right? Images through Instagram and so on. So I'm beginning to believe and getting lots of evidence that image is now dominant over text. And I'm wondering if kids are really going to have to access the alphabet so much because the tools of digital literacy will help support all that, right? So I hit the N and it, it says its name and gives a sound. So just really quick, because I know you're familiar. So lines, right? Thin lines are safer than thicker lines. Jagged lines kind of make you nervous. Um, a line that's on an angle, a diagonal, is kind of, you know, something's going to happen. There's going to be movement. Um, and so the, the use of line is pretty important. Um, color, now color diff is different culturally, right? So different cultures will value and interpret colors differently. But um, in the US, um, cool colors suggest calm, red is you know, an attention getter, and so on. Um, perspective, I heard about this a little bit in a presentation I just went to before lunch, but looking at what does it mean when you look from the bottom up? What does it mean when you look as a bird from the top down? What is it straightforward? How do I interpret the work based on those kinds of uh, perspectives? Uh, media, uh, what does the illustrator use? Watercolor is softer, right, than oils. Um, what about all the digital photography that we're starting to see come in? Um, and texture, can you feel it? I like, I mean, I actually, Anthony Brown books, I'll go up and try to feel the, the ape and stuff because it, it looks so real. So here's just some of the people that I'm going to share. Um, and there's lots more because every day as I go and look, there's more. Like I just came from a session and now I have to go to Reading Australia because there's a whole bunch of books that I now have to include that I didn't know about before. So these are some of the illustrators that we'll play with. I like illustrators that, that offer openness to the interpretation. So you, you won't see me sharing anybody um, that has a very closed interpretation of what they're trying to share. So let's get to it. So you know Sean Town, right? Most confusing illustrator I think I've ever tried to understand. And now I've been taking his work into fifth grade, so I'm getting brave. I'm working with older kids. Um, and, and seeing how they interpret the openness of his work. And he talks about that, about the fact that it needs to be open. Otherwise, he doesn't feel successful. And then he talks about these little images that he creates. Oh, so simple. Don't you wish you could just like sit down right now and draw that? Because there's no way I could do it unless I had it underneath with tracing paper on top, right? OK. But how do I interpret that? What does that mean to have that bird sitting on top? I mean, I don't really know. To spend some time with it. Um, and then, have you all seen The Bird King? It, it's a book that just has his images in it. It's not a story created in any sort of story sense. It's just his images, and you'll see images like this. And um, I love to ask it, so why do you think he drew that that way? What does that mean? Do you connect with that? Um, what do you think about? So here's one from one of his new books, Rules of Summer. So just look at it. And the way um, I play with it is that you first notice, because if you don't notice, you can't interpret, right? So think about what you're noticing. And you might actually, sometimes it's more fun to share with somebody, but I'll time you. It'll be pretty tight, um, about what you notice in that image. So you've got all of like 15 seconds. Go for it. OK, I'm hoping, did you notice the two boys? Or two children, if you weren't sure there were boys. You, you had to interact with the book to know that they're boys. Um, are they the same age? Now, they appear to be one older than the other, right, because one's taller. Now, that's not necessarily always the case. Trust me, in my family, size and height don't really correlate with anything. Um, but at any rate, we could be guessing that one is, one is older than the other. Do you see the older one leaning down to the younger one? OK, that's an assumption of power, right? I'm leaning down to you, probably conveying something like behavior, I'll beat you, or whatever. But, but something about, you know, I'm in charge, I'm taking care of you. I think what's so really interesting, this book is, is all about power. 
um, between brothers. Do you see the power poles? Did anybody notice the power poles overhead? I mean, they really serve no other purpose than to acknowledge the fact that there's a power relationship here, right? Because it could just be a street without those power poles on it. So as you keep looking at it, look at the color. Um, it's kind of muted, isn't it? It's, it's like the end of uh, day going into early evening. Um, I don't know exactly what the significance of that is, but we could talk. The, the wonderful thing is, is that it's open, right? So you just have to be open to the ambiguity of what you're seeing. Here's another one, and um, the little brother, it, it's very hard to get this image because it, it's dark, but the, do you see the red window? which would draw your attention, right, to the red window. Well, down in the corner of the red window, the little brother is looking in. So the brother is physically outside. Does that tell you anything about the power relationships going on here? He's not even invited in the house yet, okay? And look at what's happening. So they're watching television, right? We're getting the reflection of, of the television coming back. That's Dad, I think, who looks like a cat. Don't know why. You'll have to interpret that. And then the little boy. But look at the little boy's shadow. So who does the little boy want to be like? Yeah, because he doesn't really have cat ears, right? So they're together. And if you look at the picture, well, you can't really see the picture, I'm sorry. Up at the top, right, is the dad with the older, older son. The, the young one isn't there. Happy story? Mm hmm interesting story. This is from the red tree. Do you all know the red tree? Um, I, I used, um, there's a YouTube video of the red tree and brought it in to fifth graders to interpret. And they immediately, and we didn't know that they would because they haven't had any real instruction in visual analysis, went to the notion that this was about depression. Um, I think this one image is pretty interesting. So you see the fish? Right? You notice that, right? I think it's hard to miss that one. Do you see the shadow, though? The shadow is kind of interesting, right? Because the part that's being emphasized is what? The spikes, right? And those are kind of like not calm, right? I mean, the fish looks kind of smooth at front. There are, there are some of those spikes coming up. But the notion of the spikes on the shadow kind of makes me a little nervous, right? That, that something's going to happen. And then look at the little girl under. She doesn't even notice that that big fish is above her, okay? So what do you think the fish is symbolizing for her? Calmness? Happiness? The fifth grader said she can't get out of depression. It's hovering over her. And that was their interpretation of that particular scene. Lots of talking to get there, but that's where the, they finally... Um, thought. And they liked the fact that her hair was red because it allowed them to still see her under the shadow of depression. Emily Gravett. You all know wolves? If you don't know wolves, just write it down because you have to go buy it. Okay, so I'm sorry, you do. It's one of the best picture books ever. Um, so this sweet little rabbit went to the library and got a book about wolves. Do you see the trees? in the shape of a wolf, does that look like it's going to be safe? I hope you say no, because it's not going to be. Um, and so Sweet Little Rabbit is reading nonfiction, which we want to have happen, right, about, about wolves. Oh, I'm sorry. I went too fast. Um, and eventually you know the story, right? There's a happy ending that the wolf is a vegetarian and really doesn't eat the rabbit, but really we know that's not true. Um, and so the wolf eats the rabbit, and we see the book all kind of torn apart with um, library notices that the book is overdue and all of that. Um, so you have this whole play with the text that's talking about wolves and then the wolf coming out of the book and going after the rabbit. So there's, and it will take you, when I brought this book into like with seven and eight year olds, we'll probably go through it seven, ten times before they'll let me put it down, going back recursively to see what they missed to get there, um, just using visual. Um, this is another one of her books, Spells, one of the newer ones. And um, 
this one is really tricky because you can see the frog looking out, and so he should be connecting with you, right, with the frog prints and all that kind of good stuff. And then at the bottom, um, she has all just pages ripped and torn, right? And so you start spending time turning the book upside down, trying to figure out what all those images are, because they make sense. And then do you see the two little white birds, bats, whatever, flying up? And when they go up to the top, it's a spiritual kind of sense, which is really kind of conflicting with the frog, right? Grounded in, in the, looks like a, um, a boat, but a book. So playing with that particular image. And everyone within that book is, is similar. Um, and then this one um, is all about your fears. And it, it just keeps playing with different genres totally all the way through. And kids get really excited about seeing how all the genres are mixed. So the, the mice lose their tails, and that should connect with three blind mice, right? And then we have the mouse numbers are slashed with the woman who's holding their tails uh, on a newspaper article. And then we have down that the show that the three mice were in is now canceled because they can't balance because they don't have tails. Um, and then we have an ad for knives in case you also want to participate in taking mice tails off. And so you can see. So all the different play. And I think what's interesting particularly about her books is you don't know where to start, right? So I might start up with uh, mouse cravats, but then I can't miss the woman looking out at me holding the tails, right? And so the, the wonderful thing about image is that illustrators will help you particularly pick a place, but not always. And in this case, she's not. Um, Lane Smith is just crazy, OK? When you talk to him, he's just crazy. Um, and his, his work is really open. He doesn't believe that you should write down to kids, that you should write up to kids. And his work is um, somewhat sophisticated, very sarcastic. Like, interpret that. And, and if you miss that, if you just skip to the, um, the rewritten um, tales in this book, you've missed the image, right? I mean, I don't know where you're looking first. For me, it's the eyes, and I can't quite figure out why they're there. Um, and then there's like that bat or whatever in his hand and a rabbit. I'm, I'm just confused, OK? Um, the good thing about being confused is, is kids are too, so that I approach it equally with them, right? I don't have any answers. And so we can look at why did he do this particular drawing. It's very shiny, too. You don't really feel the texture. It's a very billboard kind of feeling. And, and why would he do that? What, what are those eyes coming out of that guy's he head? And why did he lose his teeth? What? OK. Um, and then he did this one. This is a hysterical book. Um, so the princess floats. And it's a problem for the king and queen, because they really don't want a daughter who floats. So they do everything like put a seatbelt on her and all of that. But do you see how he brings the image right to her? She's above. Both um, the, the queen and the king are dressed in red so that you notice them. And so is she. So you follow their eyes right to her um, in the way they've done that. Look at the way the floor pattern is set so you go right up to her. So even though she's not the queen or the king, she's drawing the most attention. She's also up. Um, towards the middle, up towards the top. So she's more important than they are. They're more grounded. Um, we're not really looking. Uh, he didn't set it, so we're really down at the king and queen's feet. But our eyes are moving up to be able to see her and her problems. They put her in a seat belt. They do all kinds of things. Doesn't work very well. OK, and then Anthony Brown, my absolute favorite. Um, and what I love about Anthony Brown is when he's talking to teachers and the public in general, he'll just say, we take picture books away from kids way too soon. Once, and you can see from these images, right? Once you could begin to really play with these images and understand the complexity, we're saying, no, oh, probably you shouldn't be reading books with pictures, right? Um, and so I would argue there's probably no time you take picture books away from kids. Um, I've been working with Anthony Brown books, and I'm really taking risks here when I go into high school. And they look at me like I'm really crazy, like, Diane, don't you know you don't, shouldn't be bringing in picture books? You know, we're way too sophisticated for that. And then we start looking at them. And um, 
and then I'm buying them copies because they want to look at them more. One of his newer books that we've seen in the U.S. is One Gorilla. Um, it's a simple counting book, except it's not. Every ape gorilla in there, their eyes are telling a different story. So even though they may be seven of the same, they're, they're unique individually. Um, and there he is with um, Voices in the Park. This is, again, one of his newer ones. I don't think I'd like to be a character that's represented in blue, right? What does blue kind of mean to you? Cold, right? Or not. And look at he's looking at you, which means he's demanding that you do something for him. Because he's, he's, he's not looking within the book. He's looking out at you. And if you look at the house behind him, the windows, like I don't know why sharks are in one window, but I don't really want to go into that room. And then there's some bear. The um, chimneys, if you notice, one's shaped like a crown, one is not. What's the significance of that? Why do you think he did that? Um, this is a simple story of a little boy who's supposed to go to a birthday party, but he's afraid. Um, there's a scene. Let me go to the scene in the book. That's what he's envisioning a birthday party to be like. I hope you haven't gone to any like that recently. Um, but that's what he was thinking. And when you see where Brown got the idea, if we go back to Brugel's work with children's games, you see how he stole, actually stole those ideas. And so sharing the paintings with kids helps them understand the significance of that particular event. He's also playing with the floor again to draw you in. Um, red will bring you in. Um, the ladders don't seem to be touching anything, so they don't seem particularly stable, but they're there. And who are these characters? Oh, some of you are way too young. That's the problem. Tweedledee and Tweedledum, there they are, okay, historically. And, and we see them come in. Now, visually, I think the, the image is pretty interesting, and they're totally out of control. Um, but the other thing is, if you know about them from other literature, right, you build that connection um, with them. I mean, I don't know why they're dumping the one into the pot, but so be it. Um, and then Lauren Child. I, she'd make me nervous. I don't think I'd want her to come to my house, right, because she's, she's looking at things, and then she's going to take that, and then it's going to show up in her books. So. What I think is really interesting here is if you look at the trees, they're all very vertical, so I'm not worried about those trees hurting anybody. Do you see how the skis are angling in so that you see the little girl that you focus on her? And how the text is also a visual image leading you right from those children to the forefront to the little girl. And cold colors. It kind of reminds me of what this morning was in Canberra. Right? Um, who's afraid of the big bad book? Um, I think what's really interesting here, if you look at it, is you see the child balanced on all those books. Not too stable, but doesn't look like the kid's going to fall yet. Leaning a little bit, and particularly in the shadow, so a little risky that might, that might happen. But look at the power of the hand coming in, but not the whole hand. So you're imaging something, right, that's coming. And, and what um, Lauren Child is doing here is actually taking you so that you turn the page. So she's controlling your speed of turning the page. You'll look at the cover, you'll play with it, but then that hand is pulling you to turn the page. Gus Gordon, sweet little kid, that's him, by the way. That's the illustrator. I don't know if you're familiar with this book, Herman and Rosie. Oh, I love Herman and Rosie. Um, they're lost in New York, and you can see at the beginning just the way he's positioned them on the cover with their backs to each other, they're not even aware of each other, right? Um, I always go to Herman's head because of the, the, the bright green. Um, and then I see the A. I want to ask Gus Gordon, why did you make the A in Herman red and the O in Rosie red? What did you want me to notice about that? And there they are in love with the moon behind them. So big circles are safe, right? So they're encircled in that, in that big moon. The big red kangaroo. This book is really tricky for me. 
Well, first of all, I don't know a lot about kangaroos, so that would probably be an issue. But um, visually, I think the, the cover gets you right there. Big red is in white, kangaroo is in red. It's even tricky to think about. I'm thinking the red should be red. No, I want to ask Graham Byrne why that was done. When you look inside, I mean, I'm thinking kangaroos fighting is probably not such a safe thing. Maybe from a distance, it's okay. But you see, again, the big circle behind and how safe it is. I think the other interesting thing here is in playing with font as an artistic element, the traditional text is the story, and the italics is the content. Again, I'd like to ask why that decision. I would think it would be the opposite. What are you telling me in the italics um, about the, rea you know, that they, they really do fight, right? And they can really hurt each other. And the story is all in traditional text. And then you see the other uh, kangaroo is kind of telling the story, but outside the circle. So how scary are wolves in children's picture books? Draw a quick sketch. Well, you don't have time to draw a quick sketch because I'm looking at the time, and I know you don't have time. So what I want you to do is think about, so if I were to draw a kind wolf, now that might just be an oxymoron to you, but think about it, a kind wolf. What would that wolf look like? What wouldn't it have? Now if I want to make the wolf scary, how would I have to shift that kind wolf to make that wolf scary? So you got it? So you know how they're different? Okay, so now you're going to have to rate scary wolf, kind wolf. Why kind? Look at all those jagged teeth. They kind of, yellow eyes glowing in the dark. Okay. Most people say, and I'm thinking, looking at that little creature down there, I'm not so sure that creature thinks that wolf is kind. But there's something about the eyes, right, and the nose, even though you look at all those elements and say, ooh, not so good, sharp teeth, scary. Not so scary, right? What about this one? Look at the... The humped, oh, poor wolf, they locked him in a, so sad, right? Until later in the book. But at this point on this page, pretty sad, right? Even the tail's down. Look at the eye down, okay? Um, what about Becky Bloom's book, Wolf? Right there in the middle reading a book. And by the way, if you want to know anything about beginning literacy, this is the book. I don't know why animals can learn to read so easily. Most of the kids that I've worked with didn't learn to read that easily, but animals, a couple pages, they're readers. Um, but Wolf starts off only being able to decode very slowly, and the animals tell him to go practice. And then he comes back, and he reads like a fluency champ with no inflection beginning to end, and they say, ooh, not so good. And then he finally comes back orchestrating everything. So you kind of get the whole picture. But there he is, look right in the middle, glasses even, you know? Kind wolf, right? He's got a pig and a cow and a duck right there, not afraid. So that's kind of giving you more clue to that. What about this one? Do you love the perspective of that? I mean, when I look at that, I go, oh, rabbit, you are so stupid. Move. Move. No. And see, I don't even see the whole wolf. So if you were thinking about teeth and all of that, you don't even see it here. Scary, right? What about this one? This is, to me, the scariest wolf I've ever seen in a picture book ever that Ed Young did quite a while ago with Lon Popo. Look at the, the way he's put light on the eye and just on half the mouth. What, what an incredible technique. Um, if you could look at it closely, you almost feel you can touch the wolf's fur, which I think makes it even scarier. And then separating it off with the pain, right? So I'm feeling a little safer for the kids because they're in a separate window, but still pretty scary. What about this one? Yeah, I'm not messing, you know, because I'm thinking Little Red Riding Hood, and she's not around anymore, right? Just the cape. Again, look at the wolf. We call that demand looking right out at you. Like, if you don't believe I can kill you, you're really wrong. 
because I'm coming. Um, the forest is really dark. All we see that red, it feels to me like blood. Beware of the storybook wolves. A little scary, but aren't you thinking storybook? I mean, that's what I'm thinking. So yeah, I don't think I want to be sitting reading in my house and have a wolf come behind my chair. Um, and even with his tongue up, I'm still not too worried. This is the wolf story, what really happened. He's winking at me. I'm a little confused here because he's winking at me. I don't trust people that wink at me a lot because I always think something's going to happen. Um, but he looks kind of friendly, kind of has a smile. So he's to me is ambiguous. I'm not sure. But maybe he's winking at me because he knows I know the story and he's going to go eat little red down there pretty quickly. I don't know. Um, not scary at all, right? Really postmodern, really kind of interesting. And actually can't see so well because he's got glasses again. So how would it really be to engage in the vigil first? So we're just going to play a little bit with voices in the park. If you're familiar, then you've got a big leg up. If you're not familiar with this book, write it down. You have to buy it. Um, and he did, um, Anthony Brown did this book twice. He did it earlier in his career, wasn't very satisfied with it, and redid it. Um, redid it. So if you look here just at the cover, what season is it? Why is the grass so green? I don't know. Plays with, he plays with seasons all the way through. Absolutely fall, you look at the red. Look at the um, font with voices in the park. Voices is what? Pretty open, isn't it? In the park is like etched in stone. What is he trying to tell me there? Like, is the park a really serious place? And, and why is voices such a primary um, way of representing that word? Um, obviously, he has straight trees, so I'm not worried about them falling. He's leading me way back in with his lines and perspective. And under that kind of crown thing are the two kids. So he's bringing me right into the kids that are kind of the stars. There's a whole other story that goes on in here with the dogs. And the one, you can, you can see them off to the right. They're always outside the main part, but they tell a whole story all the way through the book. So here, um, there, it's four voices, four people going to the park at the same time, but each chapter is a different perspective. And actually, I use this book in my qualitative research class because it's the same event, but from different perspectives of people going there. So if I look at that house, are you worried about that house falling down? You should say no. OK, no. Look at it, it's on big concrete slab, right? Is this house like in need of repair? No. Do you think the person who lives in this house, actually that woman down there with the red hat, is worried about money? No. She's pretty wealthy. The house is white. Look at the uh, fence all around it. Although it's really kind of interesting, the grass is green and we have fall in the back. And if you look at the, um, the finials on the fence, everyone in front of her has her hat. So the hat is the motif all the way through. Do you see her son? Kind of, a little bit right behind her. What does that say about the son? Do you think he has any power agency? He has none, none. Um, and actually, I don't want to play with the text very much here, but she takes Victoria, our pedigree Labrador, and Charles. So the dog is more important. OK, talk to somebody next to you. What do you notice? So let's talk about it for a second, and um, we'll see how much we agree on what we noticed. Did you notice the pole separating them? 
Who has more space, the poor guy or the wealthy woman? The wealthy woman has a lot of space. Is her space clean or dirty? What about his? His is so dirty, he even has the container for dog poop on his side, OK? Her clothes, do you, I mean, really, do you go to the park dressed like that? OK? I mean, she's in the color blue, a power color, a royal color. She has the red hat, more power. Anthony Brown is just giving her power one way after another. She's standing up, looking over him, doesn't look at him. He's beneath her. So she's looking over, over him. But if you look at the trees on his side, they're starting to scream. Um, but they're a little more stable than the trees on her side. And actually, look right behind her head. Do you see the two trees almost like in an X? Which shows there's going to be some movement there. Something's going to happen, and it's not going to be good. Um, from the one tree at the bottom, if you look right to the left of her hat, it almost looks like the burning bush. There's a flame in it, in the shadow. What does that mean? Um, did you see the alligator? Did you see the wolf going right to her feet? What does that mean? OK. Um, this is the, the image that I've used with high, schools or a lot, high school students a lot. And we go on and on. And it leads into representations of power. Who has power? Who has not? How do we know that? I mean, he's looking down. He's all hunched and small, right? Doesn't assume any power at all. So we could play with this one for a lot longer. Here's another one. I'm just going to take you through it. So if you look at Smudge, the little girl with the red on, you can see the red. You see how the clouds break for her? It's a beautiful day. For him, not so much. Um, he's never gone on a slide before. Between his legs is the screen. And then there's a broken airplane down on the bottom. And the slide comes out of the frame. So you know you're going to die if you go down that slide. Okay. Um, this one I love because of the hats. Uh, and the repetition, so for those of you who are working with students, I don't care what grade level, talking about motif, here's a visual of what motif is. And look at him. He's away from his mom, but look where the shadow is. So we could even play with shadows. Let's go back to Sean Tan, and now let's look at Anthony Brown and the way they use shadow. Um, I was in a museum in New York with Magritte, and Anthony Brown uses Magritte. So do you see the the lamp post with the light in. Actually, there's blue clouds in there, um, white clouds with blue sky. And if you look here, do you see the lamp post? So again, the connections from um, painters to his work. What about this one? This is also Magritte. And then here's his representation. If you look at the back, the dog ran so fast it ran right through the tree, but the tree stands up. Um, and you can see them running through the park. So I think it's really interesting when there are these connections to painters, in this case, to, to make the connections with kids. And why would he do that? Why would you have a tree where the dog runs through it? I mean, really. I'm still working on that one. If you figure it out, please come see me, because I can't figure it out. What about the coat? So different. Do you see how, how it's so different with the flying? And the coat is really special. Do you see the outlining around it? Um, the hands taking you forward. Um, this image, the coat is now red. And it, if you wear the coat, you can play music. Um, but it's, it's a cutout, right? We don't have any of the background. What does that mean? Does it give more attention to the coat? Um, who is she looking at? Um, my, one of my favorite books right now, it's Knock Knock. It came out a couple years ago. Um, it's a true story. Um, of a dad and his son. Do you see? It, it's framed. It's soft. Do you see? I'm not worried about that dad and son. I can tell just by looking at them that there's love for the two of them. The way he has his hand wrapped on his dad's back, the way the dad is subtly leaning into him, all the soft folds on the shirt, um, the yellow leading out the door. I don't know what that means yet. Um, but at this point, can you? Can you see how that emotion is reified in the way this illustrator created that particular drawing? Uh, and then later, 
the story is, and it's a true story, his dad leaves and says, you know, he loves him and all that. His dad is in jail. Um, and the dad won't let him go to jail to visit him. So there's a real separation. So he sends his dad letters. Do you see the letters like flying out up? The whole um, symbolic part of, of freedom going away, um, the messages. We only see the back of him. He plays a lot with us only seeing the back of characters, but his arm out. The blue sky um, representing more safe, more hopeful. It's a beautiful book. Banjo and Ruby Red. Um, this one is totally different. Ruby Red, I go right to the red, right, with Ruby Red. And plus, she's up on top, so I figure she's pretty important. And I'm thinking Banjo, not so much, because he's looking up to her. Um, but I have to interpret this book very differently, because look at all the play and all the movement. And again, the Ruby Red learns to bark. OK. Um, and for kids, the way, I mean, it's not a different rooster, right? The rooster's being represented. It's the same rooster in different places. We finally get close up. So why is that important? Why would we get close up? What, how, what, what does that mean? So we'd be playing with that as well. But it's different, right, than the other illustrations. Um, too many shaky dogs. Um, totally different, right? Where do you even begin? I don't know. I always start in the beginning with the two things going after each other. I'm not sure that that's right, but that's where I start. Um, so at first, students will notice. And that's what we were doing, right? So you'll notice the pole. You'll notice the top of the slide. You'll notice that he looks scared. You'll notice that the wolf looks frightening. But you don't want to stop there. So this is where we go from shifting from noticing to interpretation. Because if you just stay with noticing, it's like literal comprehension, right? You kind of get it, but you really didn't interpret it. And so we go, why my brown have represented him that way? What do the colors tell you? What about the shapes? What about space? Why are different aspects of that composition here and not here? What about the positioning of them? And so this is the kind of language that we're working with with, with kids to start figuring this out, because you don't want to stop at notice. Um, and here's an example of that. So Smudge's father is on the bench, and his side is smaller. He's poor, so he doesn't get as much space. Do you see the shift in that? But you can't get to interpreting unless you notice. So it's fundamental to start there. But you can't stop there. His side is dirty. Does it mean that poor people are dirty or that the park people don't clean up for the poor people? That turned out to be an afternoon conversation. Um, so in a visual read aloud, we give preference to the visual, obviously. We showcase that picture books are both image and text. They're not just one or the other. Um, we privilege current multimodal practices. So it's not just text. It's not just image. It's the intersection of both. We privilege students' interpretations because there aren't clear defined interpretations of the images. Even the illustrators will say, I purposely created ambiguity. And what does it expect of teachers? Um, you have to be able to support kids through the ambiguous. Sometimes I just want to get to a clear answer, right? Be done with it. It won't happen. And what will happen is kids will keep coming back to it. It's very recursive and it's very addictive. I warn you. Um, you, could, you continuously have to nudge students beyond noticing. Sometimes they'll be very happy with, oh, I, it's almost like, oh, where's Waldo? Oh, I found him. There he is. Done. So you really want to nudge them beyond that. Um, you want to stay in the visual, and you don't want to use it just to interpret the text. And that's hard, because we're, we're so focused on text. Um, being open to um, not finalizing clear convergent interpretations. And you know you're going to have the kid that says, just tell me what it is. Just, I can't stand this. And you're going to have to say, well, right now it might be this, but in a little bit we might think something differently. A willingness to accept the multiple interpretations on your part and on students' parts, and up to you to figure out. So I'm going to stop there, I believe, because I think this, well, let me just show you really fast. Um, but I'm not going to talk to you much about it. So we've been asking kids to do multimodal interpretations, focusing on visual. In this particular one, 
they had to use all text features to create um, uh, information about, um, this was symbiotic relationships. Then we did the giver, they all drew. I just wanna show you some because they get the notion right away. Do you see how they're using um, visual element, elements within? So we're showing movement with coming down the hill. So I just wanted to show you th that one, there's, there's more. But it's about how then we take what kids learn and notice within images um, in picture books and then we start seeing them create those kinds of interpretations to their reading. So kind of interesting. So real fast. Look, do you see the sharp? You see this, the positioning? This is when the father's killing the baby. The bike centered on safe trees so we know nothing's gonna happen bad even though the plane is up above looking for them. Um, absolute metaphor. No f real drawing, just that's what was important. Um, and then the kids really played with bird's eye wor and uh, worm's eye view. So looking at the whole village, looking down when he first sees all the books. So you get the power of that place. And then I'm going to let you see. You don't care about that. Ugh. I was going to let you see my dogs, but they're gone. <laughs> I don't know where they went. They went into the ether someplace on that. Uh, no, we're done. So hopefully, I want you to go play with image, OK, and have fun. See you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Mm -hmm. How delightful for us to have a keynote that encourages us to play with the visuals and go beyond <laughs> the visuals to the, yeah. the representation. That was fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'll hold that. Give you a hug. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>